If this is your first time with us, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Whether you're in the room or you're um, online or you're at one of our microsites, we welcome you. We're glad you're a part of us. Now, if you are new, I don't mean brand new, but you're new, okay? You've been here for a while, but uh, uh, you, you still would count yourself as new. Today is just for you because we're going to talk about who we are and how we got where we are and where we're going from here and why we do what we do. Some very important things. Now, if you're an old timer, uh, today, some of today will be review. But review is a good thing because if you're like me, you forgot some things. And so it's good to go back over it. And yet, there will be a lot of new for you as well. All right? So that, that kind of gives us a context for where today goes. Uh, we realize that, uh, that living organisms change. And we've been through a ton of changes. And then we also know that crises accelerate. And so if you already have got this climate of change and then there's a crisis like COVID, well, it accelerates the number of changes that are made. And so what, what happened was I realized that we've made a ton of changes and some of them we've not had time or taken the time to tell you about. And so we want to just use today to kind of catch you up. So today's really different, odd, peculiar. Uh, it's peculiar that we're starting with me instead of ending with me. And, uh, and then the material is going to be so different from what we ordinarily would do. That having been said, let's jump into this thing a little bit and see where it goes. Uh, what kind of church do you want to be? Now, there are a ton of good answers to that question. Well, what kind of church do you want to be? Some would immediately think comfortable. Somebody might think safe. Someone may have gone to some denominational alignment, something they're familiar with. Some might go to a style of worship. There are a ton of great answers. Let me give you our answer. We want to be healthy. We want to be healthy because we think healthy is attractive. And we think that healthy churches grow automatically. Hang on to that word. It's a fascinating word we're going to come back to right now. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus gives two parables that connect interestingly. They're both set in agricultural settings. And the first one you're probably familiar with. He opens Mark chapter 4 with this. He says, a sower went forth and he scattered seed. And some of it fell on the path. Now, what that means is it fell on hard ground. It fell on like concrete. It had been just packed down, and the seed couldn't take root, couldn't grow. Some of it fell among the weeds, and the weeds choked it out, and it couldn't grow. But some of that seed fell on good soil, and it reproduced, and it became exactly what it was intended to be. Now, that's the parable that he starts the fourth chapter with. And down in verse 26, he gives a second parable that has the same kind of language in it uh, with a different twist to it. Here it is. Verse 26, he says, he said also, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground and night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel of the head. Soon the grain is ripe, and he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now, the piece that I want to pick up on is the first phrase in verse 28. It's interesting. It says, all by itself. And it's a fascinating Greek word. It's one word that's translated as a phrase. Let me give you the word, and I think it's interesting what it is. Listen, it's automate. Automate, or automatically. All by itself. It does what the seed is supposed to do when it hits soil that is accommodating to it, when it gets into an environment that is healthy. And so our job is to create a healthy environment where the seed can take root and grow. 
That's what we do. That's why we are here. Okay? It's about creating a healthy environment. Now, uh, what kind of, what, are we good soil? Because you see, it doesn't matter what we plan. It doesn't matter what our plans are. If the soil's toxic, they're not going to work. Peter Drucker was a business guru, and he said that, uh, uh, he, he said about 60 years ago that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And he's spot on. And so what we want to do is we want to focus on being healthy. Now, when I came here, I brought a little bitty book with me. It's a little bitty book. It's called Natural Church Development. And in that book, it had eight elements, eight essential elements of a healthy church. And so we began a long time ago chasing these eight essential elements and evaluating ourselves against those. I'm going to go through those very, very quickly. And what I want you to hear is that the modifier is more important than the noun it modifies. Let me, let me illustrate with the first one. The first one is empowering leadership. Empowering le- Now, every church has leaders. But do they hoard power? Are they power control freaks? Or do they give permission do they pass along the authority? Do they, do they give responsibility and they give authority to carry out that responsibility? Or are they power hungry? But a healthy church is empowering. It passes that power out and lets you, gives you permission to do what you're supposed to do. The second one is gift-oriented ministry. And that is to say this, that the ministry is not done by the professionals. It's done by the gifted, and that's all of us. What you do is you find out what you're good at, and we turn you loose to do it. All right, we find what you're gifted at, what, how, how you fit, and we find that place where you can use that to help people find and follow Jesus. The third one in our list is a, a passionate spirituality. A healthy church is where people uh, yearn for God's word and they love to pray and they love to develop this intimacy with God. And that's what our One Step Closer plan is all about, is helping you move toward a passionate spirituality. The fourth in the list is effective structure. Effective structure. As a church changes, the structure has to change. Think of it like a hermit crab. A hermit crab lives in this little shell, but as it grows, it outgrows the shell, so it has to move to a bigger shell. The shell has to change. It has to change shells in order to stay healthy. And so do churches have to change. The fifth is inspiring worship. Now notice the modifier. Every church has worship. But does the worship stir you? Does it draw you close to God? Does it pull you in and involve you and invigorate you? The next one that a healthy church has is holistic small groups. And that just simply says where people get connected to other people. Where everybody has somebody they're connected to, somebody that cares for them and knows them, and you give permission to know you, and you guys do life together. The next one is need-oriented evangelism. That simply says that we are a church looking for ways that we can reach people who need to know what we have found. We're looking for every opportunity to uh, witness to the difference that Jesus has made for us. And then the eighth one, not last but not least, is loving relationships. A healthy church is a place that's chock full of people who genuinely care for each other. Eight essentials. I went through them really fast, but let me ask you this. Which one's the most important? There are eight of them. Which one's the most important? And the answer to the question is, whichever one is lagging behind is the most important. You've got to pay attention to which one is dragging behind, which one, which one is, is falling off the pace. And so over the years, it's shifted, and it's changed. And right now, our leadership has decided that the one that needed the most attention right now is effective structure. Now, I want to tell you, it's the least exciting of them all. When I tell you, it's effective structure, and you say, great. I mean, the other stuff sounds exciting. I can, get, I can get pumped up over evangelism, and I can get pumped up over inspiring worship. And, but those aren't the ones that need the attention right now. The one that needs attention is effective structure. So 
probably close to two years ago now, our leadership began down this path to address the issue of structure. And I want to walk you through some of that with you very quickly. Uh, it won't be real quickly, but it'll be quicker today. The first piece on the path was we took our mission statement and says, is it true for us? Now, I don't know how long you've been here, but if you've been here any time at all, I hope you know our mission statement. You may not know it's our mission statement, but I hope that you're familiar with the language that we exist to help people find and follow Jesus. Have you ever heard that language? We're here to help people find and follow Jesus. That's our mission statement. That's our purpose. That's our reason for existence. Now, you need to know that the church here is 31 years old, and this is the third mission statement we've had. What's interesting is they keep getting shorter. <laughs> they keep getting smaller. They, they keep getting easier to remember. Maybe we'll get it down someday to one that you can remember, right? Okay. But uh, that's where we started. We started with our mission statement, and our mission is, are we on mission to help people find and follow Jesus? From there, we went to our core values. Now, core values simply are a description of your personality. A core value is who you are, and you can't help it. If we were going to sit here, I could point to people today, and you'd start describing them, and what you're going to describe are the core values, who they are at their core, who they are when, when nobody's looking, all right? And we identified our core values. And the first core value for this congregation, for this church, is we care deeply about people. Always have, always will. Uh, that's what I find most attractive about this church, is how you love other people. And it has demonstrated itself in so many different ways. It's, it's the reason we had a joy prom and the reason we did fall down on the square. It's the reason that we provide funeral dinners for families we've never met before. It's the reason that we, um, uh, we are in jails and in prisons. And it's the reason that we take trips. We've got a team Tuesday going to the Dominican Republic to go down and work in the prisons in the DR. And we have people going to Haiti and people going to Africa. It's the reason that uh, we, when, when there's disaster relief that we load up vans with tools and equipment and we go down and we help clean up and we help those people because this is a congregation that deeply cares about people. This last week, we gave away two vehicles. Now, I say that and here's all that happens is somebody will come to us and say, yeah, it's not much, but it still runs. I got a car. I got a van. I got, uh, can you use it? And then we, we know somebody that can use it. And all we do is we help make the connection. We help put the two together. But it's pretty cool when it happens. And that happens because we're a congregation that deeply cares about people. And we're innovative. We're willing. The reason we're innovative, the reason we try things, is we're always looking for new ways to help people. So core to us, essential to us, is we care deeply about people. And we value redemption. We value redemption. This is a church that understands what God can do with the broken. Uh, grace isn't just a word in a song here. It's not just some Christianese that we use. It's a lifestyle. And we believe that the God, the God we serve redeems and restores. He buys back and he rebuilds and he renews and he uses us. We believe in second chances because everybody in this church has received a second chance and a third and a fourth and a 50th and a 60th and a, and we just believe in second churches. We believe in grace, but it's not a sloppy, flaccid grace because that kind of grace isn't grace. Grace has to have a backbone and the backbone is truth. And so grace and truth fit together in this wonderful way where truth gives grace its meaning. So this is a congregation that deeply cares about people and values redemption, values life change, because we're here to help people find and follow Jesus. All that making sense so far? Third core value. We're on mission. Every Jesus follower is a 24-7 missionary it would be cheating you to just let the professionals do it. It would be cheating you out of the opportunity. We believe that every one of you are gifted by God. 
I am convinced that when God created you, he placed in you gifts. From the moment you were born, you were gifted. It, it, you, your gifts tell you how you approach life and how you see life, how you solve problems. It's a gift. It's a perspective. It's the way that you are wired to work. Along the way, God gives you additional gifts to go with that. And in the meantime, you're, you're cultivating and developing skills, and you're cultivating your talents. And then you have experiences. Now, you take those gifts and those skills and those experiences, and you bring them together, and that's what makes you, you. Now, we take that package, and we look, and we find a passion. We find a passion where we can say, here are a group of people that need help. Here's a need I can step into. This fits something I can help fix. And so we identify this passion that fits our package, and we just give you permission. Go. Go. Go make a difference. Go for God. We, uh, we, we call that a cause. And we, are, we, we just believe in cause. We believe that each of you has a cause. You have a place where you can serve to help people find and follow Jesus. A way that God can use you in a really, really special way. We want to be a healthy church. Let me describe it a different way. And, and I don't mean this in any way to sound demeaning to anybody else, but I think there are three kind of categories of churches in America today. Three broad categories of churches in America today. There are those churches that fear, well, I read this morning, I read this morning, early, early this morning, uh, an article that talked about the grand resignation, that we're living in a culture right now where people are quitting their jobs and they're not going back to work and people are quitting church and they're not going back to church and people are just resigning. They're quitting everywhere and not going back. And there are churches so afraid of that, that they are driven by, please stay. And they're what I would call, please stay, churches. Please stay. Don't leave. And then there's a second category of church that also is driven by the metrics of how many people do we have in the building. And they say, please come. We've opened our doors. We're back up again. Please come. We've got our worship service going and we've got everything going. Please come. And then there's a third category. Now, there are not many of these churches, but they say, please go. Now, that's not what you think it is. That means please go. In other words, here's what I mean. We want to be a please go church. We only gather to go. We gather. Listen, I've used this language years ago. I'm going to come back to it again. This is the locker room, folks. I'm an old coach. I can talk the language I understand. This is just the locker room. This is where the team meets, we hang out together, we goof off together, we have a good time together, then we get our instructions, and we get fired up, and we go, and we take it to them, and we go out and play the game, we go out on the field. The game doesn't happen in here. We're not driven by what happens here. We're here so we can go there. So there are churches that are please stay, there are churches that are please come, and there are churches that are please go. That's who we are, fundamental to who we are. A guy named G.K. Chesterton was describing the purpose of order, or what I would call effective structure for the church. Here's what he said. The chief aim of that order, the reason that we have structure, is to give room for good things to run wild. Boy, I like that. To give permission, to give room, to empower good things to run wild. That's who we are. That's what we're about. That's why we do what we do. So what does that look like? Well, let, let, what if? What if we changed our language? What if, listen, all my life I've grown up in churches that wanted volunteers. You ever been in a church that needed volunteers? They're begging for volunteers. What if we did away with that language altogether? Because I'm not looking for volunteers. I'm looking for disciples. And if disciples are disciples, you don't have to look for volunteers. They're already there. 
it, disciples are followers of Jesus who are sold out. And so what if disciples became disciples and instead of us going looking for volunteers, you came and said, put me to work, where do I go? What do you need? How does my gift fit? Where can you use me that I can be most effective? What hole do we have that I can step into short term? Now, that's not my gift, but I'll step in there until you find somebody with the gift. What if we changed our language? <laughs> what if we changed our metrics? What if it was no longer about uh, butts in the seats or bucks in the plate? What if, what if it was about baptizers? Now, I need to tell you, we've done this one for a long time. You just didn't know it. Can I just take a time out and brag, just if I may? I, I, I hope God keeps an eye on my pride right now, okay? But I'm going to take just a moment. We, as, of, as of September the 1st, as of September the 1st, we were eight months into this year, and we've baptized 127 people. Amen. Go, God. Go, God. I'm just telling you, that just stirs my soul, okay? But that's not what stirs my soul. Ready? Here it is. Of those 127, roughly 20 of them have been baptized by our staff. That means over 100 have been baptized by you guys. This is moms and dads baptizing their kids. This is kids baptizing mom and dad. This is, this is you baptizing your neighbors and your friends. This is ex-cons baptizing cons. Uh, this, is, this is addicts telling others where they, what they found that replaced that addiction. This is, this is God doing his thing. And it's all, all being done by other people. What if, what if we measured what Patrick calls walking buddies. I love this language, brand new to me. But a walking buddy, here's what Patrick calls a walking buddy. It is when you come alongside somebody else who's not quite as far along as you are, who needs a little encouragement, needs a little help, and says, let's walk together. Let me be with you. Let me be your walking buddy. And we'll go through life together, and we'll spend time together, and we will just we will hang out, and I will encourage and my goal is to encourage you and to help you and to prompt you to become all that God wants you to be. Help you identify those gifts and how God can use you and help you to understand what to do with that passion. And we're walking buddies. And everybody here has a walking buddy. You got one that walks with you and you got one that you're walking with. What if, what if we started measuring and we changed the focus and focused the kids on kids of the incarcerated, kids of those who mom and dad are in prison and jail. And we said, we're putting together a group of people who are just going to target those kids, and we're going to step into those kids' lives and let them know, hey, this isn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You have value and you have worth, and we can break the cycle because we've stepped alongside those kids, and we've targeted that group and we've said, you're going to have a better life. What if, what if some of us just got stirred to say, I, we're going to tackle the teen suicide issue. And we're going to understand what it is that brings that and how to identify those that are struggling with it and how they can reach out to us. And we're going to get ourselves involved in these messy lives of these teens that are thinking, I'm not sure it's worth it anymore. And the way we would measure our success is when Harrison County doesn't have any teen suicides because all of those kids have found refuge. What if, what if we measured the number of people we take with us when we go on a disaster relief mission? It's not how many missions do we go on. It's not how many of our people go. It's how many do we take with. Who do we get to go with us and to share that? Let me just tell you. I, I went on the trip to Houston several years ago, and it's a long way in a van from here to Houston. There's a lot of talking time. And then to sit there side by side with big old scoop shovels and scoop out that muck 
There's a lot of talking time. And then to hang out in the evenings. And then to ride that long ride back. There's a lot of talking time. What if you, I don't come up with it, you do. What if you come up with this thing and you say, if we could do this, if we would step in here, we could figure out how to create the resources and the manpower necessary to create a tipping point for an avalanche of good. If we would just do this. The mission creates the reason for us to make some structural changes to support who we are as we move forward. Let me, let me just give you one example. When you start this stuff, you never know which one's going to take. And you don't know where it's going to take you. Take, for example, Church Anywhere. When Tyler came to me and said, I think we ought to put our services online, I said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I said, why would I want anybody to sit at home in their pajamas and watch instead of come and be a part? But we tried it, and it worked. And we went online, and the next thing you know, our online has led to microsites. And a, a microsite is where a group of people gather in one place. So it's not just one person watching the service. It's a group of people watching the service together in one place and participating and using it as a starting point for their ministries. And from our microsites, we got into jails, Floyd County and then Harrison County. And from there, we got into prisons. We got into Branchville and then Madison and then uh, Pendleton and Newcastle and every prison in the state of Indiana. And alongside that, we were in homes. We're in homes in Washington County and homes down in Kentucky and, and homes in different places. And then, and then we're in nursing homes and then we're in retirement centers and then we're in after-school programs at schools and then we're in, in uh, orphanages. I, and this thing just keeps going. And I can't keep up. And the next thing you know, we're in England and Ireland and Kenya and it just continues to expand. And now, and now we've got these digital missionaries, whatever that is. All right? Let me tell you what a digital missionary is. This is a person who understands there's a whole lot of people out there that are on the internet every day. And they like to watch all kinds of stuff. And so we have a digital missionary family that are on YouTube doing a, a cooking show. And they put their cooking show on, but in that cooking show, they make it clear that they are believers and that if you'd like to talk to them and connect to them about what's going on in your world, they'd love to know. And they connect with those people and pray with those people. And we have, we have uh, one of our digital missionaries is on YouTube, and he does covers of Broadway hits. And he plays those out, and people respond, and they connect and he is in conversation with those people. We have one, Megan, who was up here as our hostess today, is on TikTok. I don't spend any time on TikTok. <laughs> she does. She's had TikTok things with over 200,000 people following. And she has literally prayed with thousands. Thousands of people through that. It's crazy. Who'd have thought, who'd have thought that starting Church Anywhere would go like that? All of that is to say we just continue to change. And that's what living, healthy living organisms do. And so with that, we have to effectively change our structure. So what does this look like? Well, let me talk to some of these things real quickly as I close. First thing that I need to tell you is we've got to change our bylaws. I just, I've said it before, I'm saying it again, we've got to change. Our bylaws were, weren't made for a church like us. When these bylaws were written, we were a different church. Everybody met in the same room at the same time every week. So everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew everything about everybody. If I were to ask you right now, can you name the shepherds of this church, I wonder how many of you could. And I wonder how many of them you actually know. So as we have changed, that's become more difficult. We got to, we, in this room, it's hard to recognize. And this room's full twice on Sundays. And then you have the microsites and the online and all of that. 
I remember the day that we went from uh, one service to two and then two services to three when we didn't even have this room yet. And people would run into each other at Walmart and they would be talking. And, uh, and the next thing you know, they'd say, well, where do you go to church? Well, I go to First Capital. Well, I go to First Capital. You go to First Capital? Yeah, what service do you go? I'm a nine o'clock. Well, I'm a 1045. They went to the same church and didn't even know it. And now it just has gotten bigger and bigger and more and more. And as that happens, we have to change. And the doc document that we've got is for a different kind of church than we have become. So we're going to change that. Now, we're going to roll that out before you. You'll get a chance to lay eyes on it, look at the revisions, see what we're doing. We're going to talk about it. But it's one of those little pieces that we've got to change. Let me tell you a change you already recognize. You may not have really processed it before. And that is uh, we made a decision some time ago to go to a teaching team. And that simply means this, that you don't have to listen to me every week. There was a time, some of you old timers can remember, when you would hear me 40 times to 49, 50 times a year. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> but it creates the opportunity to hear a different voice, to hear the same truth from a different voice. And that's healthy and that's helpful. It creates the opportunity to share the load. And it creates the opportunity for some of our younger guys to continue to develop. Now, that doesn't say we don't let them up here until they've got something to say. And we don't let them up here until they can say it well. But some of you have watched as these guys have grown right before your very eyes. And you watched as, as, as uh, they have grown up in their communication. And you can tell the difference in their study. And you can tell the difference in their preparation. And you can tell the difference in their delivery. And the reason is, is because they're getting opportunity. And that's an important part. There's one more part to that. And that is, sometimes when it's one guy talking all the time, he gets too much authority. And we don't want that. We want to be careful with that. So we've gone to a teaching team approach. And uh, you're aware of that. Let me tell you something else. And that is, with that, we've also shifted our leadership model. When I came here ancient days ago, uh, I was the leader. I, I was it. And then as we grew over time and the load that I was carrying got to a place, the shepherd said, we think you need to share the load. Can we, let, let's have an executive pastor. And so we hired Ed. And Ed's been here now five years to help share the load. And it really, really helped. And then, as Church Anywhere has grown, it became more and more important to have Tyler in the room as we're discussing things. And so, over the course of time, Tyler became a part of the leadership team. And so now, Ed and Tyler and I serve as a leadership team. It's morphed. It's changed. And it's not like it once was. So, um, that brings us to this. I'm old don't laugh, some of you are too. <laughs> and if you're not getting older, you're dead already. So there you go. But as I get older and we realize that we've got to prepare for the day when I won't be in the role I'm in. So we have been, what started this whole thing some two years ago was conversations we've been having about a succession plan. And we realized the need for a succession plan. We need to look at how the leadership team will change when I'm not in it. We need to look at who do we raise up and who we can't raise up. And who do we bring in? And what role do they play? And how does this team fit together as we move forward? And, and succession just isn't about the old guys. I mean, today you saw that Abby has stepped away Evie has stepped in, we're in a great place, but it's because we were planned and prepared for the case that a staff member would leave us. And so now we have to be flexible in our structure to create space. Now listen, 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 listen. I'm not done yet. Don't walk out of here and say, Randy resigned today. <laughs> it didn't happen, not yet, all right? But I am trying to tell you that as we move forward on this, you need to know it's going to happen. 
And you need to know that we're going to keep you informed. It's not going to be instantaneous. There, there is a transition plan. We're working on it. And as it rolls together, we'll let you know about it. All right? I just want you to know changes are coming. We have to adjust. But I want you to understand that this church is not driven by personality. This church is driven by purpose. And it doesn't matter who sits in my seat. Now, our job is to create a healthy culture. Today, I tried to just share some of that with you.